Hi everybody, my name is Rob Scott from UC Today and today we'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges when transitioning your enterprise to cloud communications. Today I'm joined by independent consultant Graham Calder, who's going to take us through the five key stages of moving your business to cloud. Graham, welcome. Hi Rob, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, Graham, I think a great place to start would be to know a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Could you give us a little bit of an introduction, please? Yeah, happy to do that. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm Graham Calder. I, uh, I'm based in the UK. Uh, and over the last 10 years or so, I've held a number of different CIO and CTO positions in different sectors. Uh, and the common element in all of the, uh, the change work that I've been doing over that last decade has been heavy use of software as a service, cloud technology, digital technology, to uh, materially change the outcomes for the various businesses that I've worked for. Great, thanks Graham. And, and we were just talking offline a moment ago about the, the percentage of organizations that are, are still not in the cloud for their, their mm. business communications technology. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, we were saying it's, it's roughly around 20% at the moment. So there are a lot of enterprises out there currently not in the cloud. So I was kind of keen to understand more about these five pillars and I believe strategy is obviously the first place to start so could you tell us a little bit about how your approach to moving a business into a, a more sophisticated cloud environment yeah sure the um, so in terms of the strategy I mean the, any any technological change has to first start with what the business is trying to achieve and um, and where it's trying to go uh, whether that be on a three-year or a five-year timeline. But as a CIO or a CTO, the thing we've also got to bear in mind is, well, the business strategy might be for that duration. The likelihood is these systems will be around for longer. They may be around for 10, 20 years, sometimes longer. So the underlying piece that the CIO or the CTO needs to uh, ensure for the technology is not just that they've got good alignment with the business itself and that they're clearly going to deliver the business outcomes and not just a technical upgrade, which is a common problem, but also that they're building in a permanent state of agility uh, and responsiveness in the technologies that they select. I mean, we don't need any better example today of the COVID-19 uh, situation. Nobody predicted that two months ago. Uh, and every business around the world has had to react in a way it never expected. So that sort of permanent ability to change and adapt without it necessarily breaking the business or breaking your compliance position is a sort of underlying CIO, CTO strategic pillar, which then pairs up with the business um, strategic pillars. Who's involved in, the, in, the, in that decision-making process and in, in mm. the developing the, the strategic plan? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the CIO, CTO uh, can be a, a good facilitator uh, of this, but ultimately they're, they're not the final decision maker. Um, in all of the sort of successful executive teams I've been involved in where the changes have gone well, it's been a shared ownership. So you've got the key business functions and you've got your technical lead who are working together, uh, not just to, to determine the art of the possible for the business, but to help inform the art of the possible through the technology particularly where you've got some of these newer things coming through like AI, machine learning, the cloud. You know, those are not concepts necessarily that the business leaders will be familiar with. So the job of the CIO, CTO is to bring that to the table, but that's their contribution. The business owners themselves also have their contributions and their deep insight into their business and their market. And it's when you get that combination and you get that sort of joined up thinking is when the strategy will click. Because the other element of this is that all of the participants have to be signed up to the change involved because everybody's going to have to do their respective piece, whether it be deliver the technological change or deliver the business change and the business function change in order to be able to get the benefit out of the technology. Absolutely. And so it sounds like it's quite a joined up process nowadays versus mm. maybe what it used to be. I mean, there's a mm. lot more involved, isn't there? We've got users to consider teams to consider with collaboration and we've got you know, certainly customer experience to consider here as well haven't we mm -hmm. what kinds of yeah. challenges do you, do you find uh when developing a strategy like that well one of the biggest challenges is that people tend to drift back without consciously doing it they tend to drift back to what they know um so you often see situations where 
um, the strategy itself gets developed, but when it comes to the implementation, you, you, you know, most of us have probably had the conversation where uh, you, you say, right, here's your new technology, and someone says, I want it to work the way the old one does. And so well, the problem with that is that's just a technical upgrade. In order to get real change, we have to change the way that we operate. We have to change the way that we engage with our customers or the way that we engage with our colleagues or both. And often the, um, the execution is that transition from strategy to execution where the hazard is. And that's where quite often a lot of these things go wrong. So it's very important to set the ground rules uh, around how the execution is going to be done in order to make sure the strategic objectives are uh, achieved. So for example, in, um, it's, in many of the changes I've done, the rule has been we're taking the company to the system, not the system to the company. Uh, and we constantly remind people that that's what we're doing or that we're doing out of the box and that customization has this very onerous process that needs to be signed off by you know, every man and their dog in order to, um, to get that approval. And it's, it's those types of rules to just make sure that that natural drift of what people know doesn't happen or doesn't happen too much and you actually end up with the strategic change that you wish. Great stuff. And so once you've got your strategy in place, What's the next stage of this uh, this plan? Well, the next stage uh, really is twofold. One is um, to make sure that the technology team is in good shape to deliver that change. Um, often that means, particularly when we're talking about the move to cloud, you're asking the teams to learn new skills, to take on new capabilities. You know, they've got to embrace different uh, approaches uh, in terms of automation, um, infrastructure agnostic, um, more software oriented in configuration rather than build and so on and so forth. So the, the part, the job of the CIO is to make sure that the, t the technology team is set up in the right way, is it organized in the right way, uh, has it got the right objectives and has it got the right skills, has it got the right blend of it and if there are gaps then make sure that there's good plans in there to remediate that and to address it, whether that be through training or hiring or a combination or whatever. But at the same time, there's also a need to get the rest of the business functions ready <clears throat> to, um, to, 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 to accept the change because quite often, often in these situations, uh, business owners or business uh, operations staff, they believe the change is for the technology people to do and they don't necessarily recognize until quite late in the day that, there's a big change that they will have to go through in terms of their operation or the way that they engage with their employees or you know, engage with customers, et cetera, whatever it might be. And often that gets left until it's too late or it's very late and then you get a delay. So very early on, you need to start working with the business team so that they understand the degree of change that's coming and are preparing adequately for that change and making sure they've got all their plans in place as well. Would you start thinking about user adoption quite early on in that planning mm. uh, process? Yeah, but, yeah, from day one. Um, there's two things that, uh, that I do. One is um, think about how do we adopt this uh, into the organization and in front of the customer. It's remarkable how many projects I've been through where the whole thing's been built. And then when you say to the team, okay, so how are we, how are we cutting over or how are we migrating? And there's silence. Um, so actually, bizarrely, I tend to do that right up at the beginning. It's one of the very first questions I ask is when the solutions are starting to materialize, I'll ask the question of, okay, so when we come to cut over or when we come to migration or replacement or whatever the process might be, how does that work? How are we planning for that? How are we building for it? And how are we operationalizing for it? Uh, and do that. But the other thing from a technology perspective is um, – is to really think about the colleague experience, um, to really think about how this works for your colleagues. You know, for a long time, enterprise technology was um, sort of developed in a way that was good for the technology people, but when you were the user, it really didn't hang together. And uh, you, know, you get those classic comments about oh, better IT when you're at home than you do when you're in the office. Uh, and most of them are true. Um, but the, uh, what, what I've done with all of the programs I've done in the last 10 years is to adopt a product mentality 
for the um, for the internal team. And what it does is it, it, the very first thing that the teams have to do whenever they realize they're working in product mentality is they first have to say, well, okay, who's my customer? Followed by the next question, which is, okay, what do they need? Um, so what happens there is you, you end up with a much better fit between the technology and the needs of the users, and that eases adoption. And adoption is one of the biggest challenges in terms of getting technologies, new technologies, properly embedded inside large, complex enterprises. Uh, if you can get that user experience right and you can get the, the capability right, just like it works in the consumer space, people start using it. They adopt it and they give you the most valuable thing that you can get in a corporate, which is their engagement and their time. And then you can get the change done. Great stuff. And how about infrastructure? Because if you put something in, and the infrastructure falls over or it doesn't op, you know, optimize the voice quality or the video quality enough, mm. users won't adopt it. So how do you look at uh, the infrastructure and the connectivity in with this plan? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So the most important thing when, in terms of your infrastructure when you're moving to the cloud is to get your network right. And actually often that's not about deploying traditional te network technologies like MPLS or, you know, these big sort of enterprise grade, it, very often it's about actually getting really amazing internet connectivity. And that's for both your corporate locations, but also making sure your employees have access to that in all of their satellite locations. So the, the key um, infrastructure investment that I've always made in, in these transitions has to be to really, really get the network right of a really good network team and to make sure that it's, it's, it's absolutely high quality, fully resilient, you know, it's, 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 it's up to the job. Conversely, where you tend not to invest is you don't tend to invest in the traditional um, servers and storage and you know, your data centers and the rest of it. Effectively, the more you move to cloud, the more you get out of that game. Uh, and what I actually look for in the solutions is wherever possible, I actually look for zero hardware um, deployment footprints, those are my preferred solutions. Or um, if it's uh, tied to the user's device, look for device agnostic solutions. So things that run through the browser, you know, that are fully virtual in nature and therefore you don't have to worry about the hardware provision. So you find that the balance of your investment and the balance of your foc uh, your, where you focus your time and your talent shifts towards your network and away from your sort of traditional sort of hosting environments and to some extent your end user environment, although that remains very important from a compliance perspective and a flexibility perspective. But what you want to try and do, do there is get to a sort of software-based solution, which is device agnostic, and then you don't have to worry about, you know, how many laptops you've got or desktops. Yeah, absolutely. I've been, I've been on the front line deploying solutions and there's nothing more sensitive than a, a, you know, a, a VoIP packet or a video packet, for example, on the network is there. So if you get it wrong, it can be completely uh, disastrous for uh, the yeah. business, the users, uh, you know, and the customers ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, 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 the network is all, you know, particularly when you've got all those assets distributed around, um, they're not hosted in your facilities, you don't necessarily determine the location. Um, that, that, that ability to connect point A to point B and to do so reliably and predictably day in, day out. Uh, and for many big enterprises, they have got global operations. They, you know, they are very widely distributed, including, you know, low cost locations, servicing high, you know, high cost markets, etc. And again, you know, you really want to have your network infrastructure uh, buttoned down so that the, the majority of the investments that I've made in the past to underpin uh, this type of transition has been in the network. But what you find overall is that done correctly, because you've got this heavy reliance on internet connectivity uh, and high volumes of it, all, albeit done very well, that actually the cost of that is lower than it would have traditionally been if you were doing it through some of the more traditional enterprise technologies. But you then get huge saving in all of the kind of um, heavy infrastructure that you would have traditionally invested in. So your cost overall comes down quite considerably um, and in all the big changes that I've done over the last 10 years the cost of infrastructure has dropped um, dramatically uh, over the over the course of the changes it's fully embedded 
That's a really good point. Uh, in terms of the uh, next stage, when we've talked about strategy, we've talked about foundation, are we ready for innovation? Yeah, um, I think the innovation piece, and this sort of really ties back to, there's two parts to that. There's, there's the innovation that the technology organization can bring in how you solve that problem uh, and how you deliver that outcome. So, you know, the, 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 the types of uh, work that I've done in the past where there's been heavy adoption of, of cloud and, you know, as you made the point earlier on, you know, I've been doing that for 10 years and yet if you look at contact centers, only 20% of enterprises have moved in that direction. So, you know, this is still a relatively new way of working for most people in the enterprise. So there's the innovation that can be brought by bringing in new capabilities, new sort of future-facing uh, uh, techniques and, and technologies. But there's also the innovation that the business owners can bring by adhering to this sort of principle of changing the way that things get done. Because the well, initially, when presented with the case of actually we're not going to deliver things exactly the way that they operated before, there's that there's an initial period of concern but once people get through that they then begin to think about the opportunities and they begin to think about the things that they've always wanted to do but not been able to do uh, and what i find is is useful is to sort of normally to sort of run a series of workshops you know one or two in the early part of the process where you get everybody involved and you almost let them blue sky a little bit uh, but have a process that sort of slowly starts to constrain it down to the right, okay, these are the things we're going to do now, and these are the things we're going to do over the next two years. Um, so you can get the combination of bringing new capability and bringing in um, new thinking from the business because they're not constrained by the, the, the systems that they've already got, if you can get them to that point. The other thing that's really interesting about this as well, and this is one of the great advantages of cloud, because there's, no, there's very little lead time from um, deciding you want to see something uh, and see how it works to actually it working in front of you. You know, in many cases, it's a matter of hours to have some of these platforms spun up uh, and have a sandbox. You can also do a really kind of interactive process with the business where you can take them on either a POC type journey for 12 weeks to explore the art of the possible and how their whole business might change based on the technology or just to sort of do a short term, could we do this or would, would this work? Or you can do a lot of experimentation as well and that can rapidly accelerate the pace of innovation and the pace at which people's ideas come through because once they see that they can bring them to life and you know kind of interact with them a little bit albeit in a very primitive way but they they you, you suddenly see this upswell of um of ideas and innovation actually the problem you then get is how do you then structure it into reasonable packages of deliverables rather than i want everything and i want it now uh, that you know so your problem becomes a different one but all of this stimulates innovation because you you're you're your time period from thought to action and seeing something is very short in most cases if you're using the right platforms. So that's really interesting. And, and that keyword platform is, is really important, isn't it? If you've got the right platform, yeah. you, you can go forward, you can you know, integrate, you can develop uh, your ideas. As you say, you can try, try before you buy almost uh, or um, yep. just just try things as, and do POCs. Yeah, so I, I think that's, yeah. that's a great way to look at it. Do you find um, in the enterprise, a lot of organizations will kind of just get it in and kind of in a basic kind of pretty standard way and then they will innovate later and, and kind of roll out the new features and capabilities as they go along? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, I don't think that's the way the majority, certainly not been my experience that the majority start with that premise um, where what I have done in, in a number of other cases is to do exactly that, to sort of bring a whole concept of MVP uh, into corporate change. I mean, you know, everybody's pretty familiar with it in terms of digital products and the way the consumer digital companies work and the rest of it. But actually, you can apply the same principles to enterprise software and back office software just as easily. Um, so in one of the previous roles I did, we, um, we moved, um, and this was in the gambling sector, we moved the entire contact center operation for multiple brands onto one platform in just three months. But the way that we did that was to start with that MVP type approach, 
get everybody on it, then very quickly iterate and move into a two-weekly cycle where we were constantly iterating. And again, we brought the product mentality. So we had a product owner. They were working with the business owners, prioritizing the features, determining what the next two weeks would look like. So it's actually a very, very effective way of, um, of, of getting changes done and getting traction. And once you've got the momentum and people start seeing that they're getting things done quickly and that service is starting to come through, then, then you, you've, you've kind of won the battle a little bit in terms of the change process. But, you know, let's say that one took three months and that, that wasn't in a situation like we're in now. You know, I would imagine if I'd been doing that against the background of coronavirus and the responsiveness of the business, that could have easily been compressed because most of it was just in us configuring, preparing for the change and making the change within the business functions because we had something like 1,300 agents that needed to be moved um, pretty quickly. But you can do it even outside of those circumstances. You can do it pretty quickly if you want to. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad we've come on to migration. And mm. in terms of migration, what are the common pitfalls that you see in the enterprise that, that you know, where you would advise maybe or offer mm. some, some help? Yeah. I mean, the first one is the one I talked about earlier on, which is it's not considered until it's until quite close to the end of the, the build phase or the, design, you know, the actual implementation phase. So my strong advice is shift that right up front and really think about that from day one as you start to make your decisions about your technology. Think about it in the context of, okay, how am I going to get from system A to system B and do so in a way that is, uh, is, is you know, de-risks the business. Wherever possible, like most people, I try and avoid big bang. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes that is the only way to do it. Um, where there is big buying, I'll always have a back out plan, uh, whatever humanly possible. But generally, I'll set time limits on that. I'll generally say, look, we can probably back out for a week. At that point, we probably couldn't do it reasonably. Uh, but it, so it focuses everybody's minds on that first week and making sure everything is correct. Um, generally, I put somebody on, if it's a big migration, I'll put somebody on it full time. That's their job is to plan migration, to work with all the stakeholders, to make sure that everybody is ready for this because it won't just be about the technology. The businesses have to be trained. You know, the, you know, there may be announcements that need to go out through the marketing teams, the brand teams, PR, you know, finance may expect uh, reporting to come through in a different way and the BI teams. So these things generally tend to be very, very big changes and, as a consequence of that, I put somebody on it who is responsible for migration planning, uh, and they have a lot of authority, actually. Uh, and I'll generally meet with them once every week, every couple of weeks, to look at that particular issue, because that's the one that generally tends to worry me, along with, will it stand up and will it perform? Will it take the load? Functional stuff, I don't tend to worry about too much, because that tends to get corrected quite quickly. It's those three things tend to be the real problems that can have long-term impact. And, you know, you may be living with pain for quite a long time if you, if you don't get those right. So I tend to focus my time on those. Great. So you've gone live. The lights mm -hmm. are on. How do you optimize the investment? Uh, how do you get the best out of, you know, the, the solution? And how do you get users to ultimately be as productive as possible with something like this? Yeah, good, great question. So, I mean, all of this ultimately is about getting benefit. You know, if you don't do that, then, well, it's just another load of old tech uh, or new tech. It doesn't really matter. You know, none of these things succeed unless the business is better at the end of it than it was uh, at the beginning. And the, the, the two things that I tend to use, one is uh, particularly in the contact center space, for example, is engagement with the users you know, checking in with them every day. So daily calls, daily checkpoints, you know, one-to-one -one conversations with the, with the team leaders and with the, with the heads of the functions, just to make sure that everything that they need, they're getting. And if there's any gremlins or teething troubles that we're on them quickly, but also then get the feedback from them about how things are working or what's not working. But the second thing is, uh, and this is another great advantage you get with a lot of the cloud systems is they're very good at giving out data and it's easy to get access to the data. You can do it through your BI system, but you can just as easily do it by sending it off to Google Sheets or 
off to um, you know some of the other sort of um, enterprise tools that are out there uh, that will very quickly give you some information. And you know platforms like Ring Central, for example, they've got a rich set of reporting and uh, and BI capability out of the box, so you can very very quickly get a, a feel for how the business is functioning. And uh, often it tells you things that you didn't know because the, the, the problem with many of the legacy systems is that the, uh, that sort of linkage between the reporting and the analytics and BI systems and the actual production platforms is not that strong. It's kind of been made to work rather than being designed to work in the first place. So what I find, you know, what I find in the past is that often that what people thought was going on is not what actually was happening. Uh, and in one of my other roles, we had this uh, situation where the the teams realized that they, 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 their sort of handling times and their um, quality of service, et cetera, wasn't actually what they, they thought it was. It, was. it wasn't as good. But they were able to very quickly take the corrective action off of the more accurate reports. And within a matter of weeks, were hitting all of the objectives that they've been They've been trying to achieve for some time without really being able to. Just that ability to get better data. And I think the great thing about the, the cloud platforms particularly is they almost all do this in real time. And it's the ability to take action there and then rather than after the event. Because very, you know, anybody who works in contact sales, they know two days are the same, really. So, you know, what you see yesterday is not necessarily what's appropriate for today. So, the, the, you know, these the fact that these platforms are built on these real-time engines and they have these sort of rich suites of reporting that anybody can get information out of is a hugely powerful thing. So I tend to use both conversations and anecdote and sort of basically watching how the teams are, are, are using the systems and whether or not they're getting out of what they need, uh, but also then pair it up with the data. So does the data back it up or is there gaps? And are we, how are we performing relative to what we did before? That's a really good point around the data and the analytics. I, I completely agree. I think if you're gonna, mm. if you're gonna maximise your investment, you've got to know what's going on. And uh, as you say, yeah. some of the insights you can get from these solutions nowadays is far greater than they used to get in the legacy, uh, legacy platforms. Yeah, very, very much so. And you know, you can either use them out of the box, or you can export the data off to your your BI platforms. Uh, you can send them to, to different things. And it, it really does democratize the data and, um, and give you much greater ability to, to react to events. And the third pillar, the third, the third function that's really important in this, of course, is the finance function. Because ultimately, you know, these have been done in enterprises and they're there to make money. You know, you can bring your finance department in and they can help a lot with understanding whether your investment is actually paying off or you're seeing it in hard cash and and the upside and if not what's the corrective action that needs to to be taken so that sort of three-way relationship between the business function that owns the ability to change the technology people who own the platform and the finance people who can say whether or not that combination is is you know better or worse financially that's the sort of triumvirate you need at the beginning and certainly for the first probably for the first quarter or so um, just to make sure that you've bedded in and your investment is beginning to come through. And then you can move into your two weekly iterations uh, and continuously monitor your performance from then on in. That's fantastic, Graham. Hey, it's been great speaking to you today. Uh, you've shared some nice. really, really good insights. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Ring Central, and all our, and all our viewers watching. Uh, so if you've enjoyed today's session, we'd really appreciate a like or a share. Uh, but we'll see you again soon.